Hello friends, welcome to Experience Data Talk, a show featuring data science leaders and technologists from around the world. My name is Mike Delgado, and this is episode number 119. Today we're chatting with Eric Haller, who is our Executive Vice President and Global Head of our Experian Data Labs. I got a chance to catch up with him to find out how he was doing during this pandemic, and also how he is managing his data science teams and data projects that are happening around the world. In today's show, we chat with him about ways Experian is using data science to track and understand COVID-19, and also how they're using data and analytics to help people and organizations that are hurting right now. At the end of the conversation, we talk a little bit about internships and what it takes to work at our data labs. And he also gives advice for graduates who are just finishing school and looking to get their first job. It is super hard right now because of the pandemic. People can't come in to interview. And Eric shares some advice for graduates looking for their first roles. We talk about this and a whole bunch more. Here's our conversation. Eric, thank you so much for being on Data Talk. Glad to be here. Tell me a little bit about what work and life is like for you right now as we've all transitioned to working from home. Well, I, uh, I'm i working in a room that I never go into in the house. So I'll start with that. <laughs> it's a room off to the side that never gets paid attention to. And uh, and now I live here about 14 hours a day. <laughs> so it's uh, the one of the things that I've noticed about working at home is you can't get away from your work. It's like... The moment I walk down the stairs, even when I'm headed to go get some coffee and breakfast, it's like my office is right there. So you're you're kind of naturally pulled in. And I think I'm noticing that with a lot of folks that they're probably working more hours right now than, than they have previously because they're, they're living with their work. So it's, uh, it's different. I know people work from home all the time, but if you're used to going into an office, it's, it's different. Yeah, I was talking to a lot of people who have been working from home for the last couple of years, just to kind of hear their perspectives. And they told me that it took them a while, like two or three months to kind of get used to that kind of environment, because like the work life balance is really hard initially, because like you said, yeah. the, op- the computer's right there. And you're just thinking, Oh, I'll, I'll check an email really quickly. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the the WebEx has become so easy to use that uh, I'll text somebody and I'll say, hey, I just ran into something. Uh, you have 15 minutes for WebEx and you do a quick invite and I, you know, I'm spending all my time staring at this screen now. Uh, it's, it's, it's different. I mean, you, I think we're all adap- adapting to it pretty quickly. Uh, but right now when I'm talking to the labs, I've been advocating for them to slow down, mm. which feels really weird. But because people are working so many hours right now, uh, because I, I'm thinking it's because it's in their home. It's also because of the, the, the world that we're in right now and the quick pivots that we've had to do um, to, to help our clients and, and help our business units uh, adapt and, and swing, swing around. Uh, but, you know, the, during the weekends, people are working. Uh, the, the days, probably because of the pandemic, a Friday feels no different than a Saturday. And, and so you're just in this perpetual mode. So I've been cautioning people against burnout um, because I do believe a burnout can become a, a big factor. Um, uh, I've been trying to encourage people to exercise and go get fresh air. Like it's, it's they all sound like dopey things. Like if, if you'd said this pre-pandemic and you said, yeah, I have to encourage people to go get fresh air. <laughs> like, <laughs> give me a break, right? But uh, it's become it's become a real challenge because people just there's there, I think as the days are ticking by, rather than being more and more apt to go outside, people are becoming more and more apt to stay inside, and um, and so it's just trying to remind people that there is going to be life after all this. We're all going to see each other again soon, and uh, so you know I want everybody to be healthy, and uh, and and excited about going back into the office. Um, that, those are important things. Yeah, I was chatting with some friends who would tell me before the pandemic they were very much introverts, and now they're telling me how much they desperately want to be back in the office right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very few people I've run into are, are happy about working from home. Like even, and it's funny you said that. Even the people that say I'm an introvert, this is my life that I've always wanted. They want yeah. they want to go back into. It's just. Especially in the world of data science and, and uh, software development, uh, there's so much collaboration that takes place naturally. Um, even even when you're an introvert, you're still likely to collaborate with one or two other people. 
and and so doing that face to face in front of a whiteboard or whatever it's it's a very different experience than trying to do it over the over the your laptop what's it been like you know you manage and oversee teams all over the world um and then you're of course you're used to working with your team here in san diego area uh in person what's it been like just with your own team that you're not able to see day to day now it, well to be honest i really like the people i work with so i get bummed out that i can't hang out with them so we have done some social things where you know five o'clock comes around and i'll encourage some people to webex with me we have a drink and we just kind of hang out and chat um and that's helpful uh i have tried to establish some regular cadence meetings so typically like typically i would do an all hands once a month i'm doing them every week now mm. um and then with my uh regular uh leadership meeting which i do once a week i'm doing those twice a week so it's you know, they get to see me a little bit more. I get to see them. We get to talk more. Um, the all hands, it's not like, you know, we used to, my all hands meetings, we usually have an agenda with a series of things that are presented out to the team. And, you know, it's, it's pretty structured. Um, this uh, last few uh, all hands meetings we've just been doing, uh, I just go one by one. And just people give them two minutes to say what's going on in their life. Mm. It's not even work related. Mm. It's just, you know, how, how is it taking care of the kids? Are you getting your groceries? Um, you know, how are you feeling? Uh, and, and we all, most of us have worked with each other for now more than a year. Like the, the average tenure in the lab's probably about four years right now. So we have a lot of really well experienced people in Experian. And, um, so they all know each other. So they, they're very comfortable in sharing. They want to share. Everybody wants updates. Uh, globally, I do a, a weekly global call, leadership global call, which was something I would do once a month. Now I'm doing it every week. Um, and that's that's a little bit of less sharing because those are lab leaders. So everybody on that call it runs a lab. So it's much more about exchanging ideas and what's hot in each part of the world so that if we can... Uh, learn from each other it may it may help in what we're developing locally in each in each geography those um those calls you have with regional leaders obviously those have always been done remotely because everyone's in different locations have you noticed that those types of calls have they changed at all or is it just kind of like business as usual more business as usual i think uh, yeah because we're all used to it uh you know the subject matter is different but the uh the exchange the interaction is the same what has been the interest from the different data scientists that work under you as far as working on COVID data projects? So there's clearly a lot of passion. The labs are are focused on different things um, res with, with respect to COVID. Um, the, the Brazil lab has probably done more to just take on COVID uh, um, uh, head on and trying to track the disease as it spreads around uh, Brazil. And, and they've done, a, I would say, it's like an open platform approach where uh, they've created an environment for lots of different companies to come together and share information, several top universities to share uh, 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 intellectual horsepower. Uh, and, and even Amazon has, has jumped in to share with creating infrastructure to support it. Uh, we have even competitors that are, are partnering together to help track the, the virus and, and look for different characteristics that might help for forecasting uh, uh, for spread or, or for um, supporting things like hospital bed uh, deployment and ventilators and those types of things. Um, that of the four labs, that's the only one I think that has really gone out there full steam to address it. And I think Brazil was a little bit behind the curve in terms of the disease spread, which mm. gave them some visibility from a global perspective to realize that if they put that kind of approach in place, they'd be able to, um, it, it would be effective. Um, in the U.S., you know, we really didn't have that. I mean, it came right on top of us so fast. Mm -hmm. And we evaluated the, the landscape and assessed that our best objective was to focus kind of where the, the puck was headed, which is more around consumer vulnerability, who's likely to be most impacted by this because the business that they work for is shutting, shutting the doors or has shut their doors. Um, and, and so to give the government and our clients more insight into what kinds of programs or policies uh, they can put in place to help to cut the consumers that are at highest risk, 
Same on the small business side, looking at who's vulnerable, as well as these the CARES Act and who's most el who's eligible for mm -hmm. CARES Act help in helping bridge those pieces together. And then thinking about when we do recover, how are those small businesses, uh, who are we likely to focus on in terms of who's recovering the fastest and who's struggling? It's where we get the help for those who are struggling and make sure that the people that are recovering, the businesses that are recovering the fastest uh, uh, gets the credit that they need to continue to fuel that growth. So uh, it's been very much a uh, uh, focus on the businesses and the consumers. The UK lab, uh, what they right out of the gate went to the uh, NHS, which is their uh, health and human services uh, agency that for the UK government. And they, uh, you've probably heard me speak uh, in the past about the different kinds of models that are used to track a disease, like the susceptibility, susceptibility infection uh, removal model that uh, is often used in the market. Uh, our UK lab is working with the government in the UK to bring a lot of information to that SIR model and improve its forecasting abilities. Awesome. So literally, you know, helping hospitals in that fight around figuring out uh, the maximum impact, the number of people that are going to come in seeking critical care condition or critical care attention. Uh, we're helping with that in uh, and fine tuning and, and improving the accuracy of those models. So it's a, it's quite a quite a spread. Uh, I've always tried to keep the uh, the labs focused on the what's hot and important in the market that they reside in, and this actually is a benefit to us because we develop a broader portfolio of intellectual property. So if you think about it, like the work that the UK is doing with the NHS, if in fact it's determined over the next couple of years that the HHS here in the US has similar needs, we can pull some pages out of their playbook. And be able to go to the HHS and be able to, to help them uh, in a similar way. Um, uh, just like the work that we're doing in consumer vulnerability and small business uh, recovery is the same kinds of pages out of the playbook we can pass to Brazil and the UK and Singapore and help them with that. So uh, it's been effective for the last 10 years that we've been doing this, I think seven years now with more than one lab. And uh, uh, we're continuing with that same, same approach. That's super cool. Um and I like the fact that you're looking at all different types of communities and you mentioned the, the small business communities. And I know that your lab has done so much work to help small businesses. Can you talk a little bit more about the things you're doing right now to help small businesses recover from COVID-19? Well, it is it right, right now for the lab, we're just trying to figure out how we can make sure that we know who is recovering. So um, we're looking at, if you think about data, you know, and, and in this kind of environment where you're trying to gather information, know just what's going on. Um, I, I believe that there are data sets that are leading indicators, data sets that are current, insightful on what's happening right now, and data that, that are just lagging. Like you're, you're kind of looking in the rearview mirror to see what happened a certain amount of time ago. And uh, so right now, our attention really is focused on securing and modeling with leading data, leading indicator data and current indicator data. So uh, things like uh, payment card transaction information, that is a fantastic, uh, uh, it's definitely current information, right? You're not looking so much in the rearview mirror, you kind of know what's what's going through the till at that at that time. Uh, now it's, it's hard to get an immediate knowledge of it, usually even in the best case scenario, working with companies that capture this data and can can work with us on this. You're looking at a one week, one week lag. Uh, GPS data, which is traded pretty frequently in the mobile application market, leveraging GPS data to see how that footfall traffic is a little bit sooner in the process. And so, and with GPS data, I may not necessarily need to see folks engage in a payment card transaction as much as they walked into the, into the store. So we know they're open. Uh, so that could be a leading indicator. Right. The store's open because all of a sudden we're seeing people walk through. So capturing that data and then modeling for it so that we can get that, that life cycle of a business in a clear picture will allow us to get that information out to our clients such that they can do the best job they can of evaluating need uh, and, and, and risk uh, associated with that, that small business. We've done similar things like this in the past. So if you think about 
new businesses that just open up, they may not have uh, credit on our file. And, and so we partnered with social media companies to pull in information like uh, check-ins and likes and ratings and uh, um, uh, that kind of information because that could be actually very predictive of a company that is hit the scene, they're new, they don't have any credit yet, but they're actually doing really well. And we've seen a lot of success with that. So, you know, from a prediction uh, perspective, we saw 40% lift on our ability to predict the mm. credit worthiness of a small business uh, for a company that's just new out of the gate. And so that's the kind of thing our clients expect that from us now because we're, we're out there in the front uh, it's coming up with these creative ways to, to assess what's happening in the market. Uh, and, and so that's what we're doing right now. We're reacting uh, to the shift and seeing if we can get our hands around this. I think, you know, there's a, uh, with 59 million people employed by small businesses in the U.S., there is a very strong link between the success of these small businesses and the success, the personal success of those individual consumers, people. You know, they, if their business is doing well, they're making money and they're employed. If it's not doing well, then they're hurting. And so, you know, our ability to be able to draw that connection in a community and understand, you know, over the next couple of years, we kind of have this, this, this uh, working hypothesis that um, communities are going to flash as hotspots, that, you know, we're going to see the virus kind of chill out and then it may rise up in a town and when it rises up there's going to be an impact of might it will likely slow down commerce in that town um because people are going to have to you know they'll, they'll either practice social repractice social distancing uh they, they may be fearful and less likely to go into a small business uh or they in, in a worst case scenario they're back in shelter in place and they're they're locked down like we are now um, so our ability to look at the leading indicators and current indicators of that and drawing that link between the small business and consumers will allow banks and the government to be able to respond more effectively and more quickly in making sure that those people are, are held up uh, and don't don't uh, you know experience uh, the problems that be associated with ink, lack of loss of income or uh, uh, a reduction in revenue for small business. I think it's super cool that you have partnered with social media sites to help gather more data. I think it's a very creative, innovative way to determine. Um, how businesses are doing early on. The first response, if you saw our strategic plans that we quickly assembled in a reaction to the pandemic, um, it's all about data first. We are drawing the biggest, widest funnel that we can to work with uh, other companies and providing the, the best data that we can uh, so that we can um, understand who's hurting. And that's, you know, whether it's a small business or a consumer, it's about um, uh, helping them as quickly as possible. Uh, I would say that um, this is a very different reaction than, you know, as a professional, I would have seen in 2008, 2009. Mm. 2008, 2009, in the onset of the Great Recession, uh, I think the response from, from our clients, from the markets, from uh, uh, companies that do this kind of work that we do about risk, it was all about risk first. It was all about how can we uh, shut off uh, the spigot to make sure that we don't lose as much money uh, as we might if we don't? And so it was all about risk management, risk containment. The, the market right now and the message that, you know, is resounding is it's all about help first, which is, you know, almost a 180, you know, from, from, from 08, 09. It's trying to figure out who needs the help. How do we get the help to them the fastest? Uh, and, and if, you know, it's more like uh, a natural disaster. Right. You know, when, when uh, New Orleans got hit by Katrina, it was about how do we help the people in, in Louisiana? And I think that's really the mindset right now uh, around um, this use of information uh, and how we profile uh, what's happening in the market. Uh, it's all about how do we get the help to them as fast and as quickly as possible. Are there like any new types of data sources that you would love to tap into in the future? Well, you know, so... Uh, there's always lots of interesting data sets. I, I have a working hypothesis that there's going to be uh, new kinds of data that are going to be captured that uh, we don't really think about. So, uh, so here's, here's an idea. I don't know if you want to put this on your show or not. So <laughs> the, uh, well, it's, uh, 
you're getting into the mind of Eric Haller. So it's a, it's <laughs> That's a, what it's all about, Eric. To be in, you know, you know, I'm not sure you want to be there. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, when, I, when I go shopping right now, and it's very rarely that I even leave the house at this point, but when I do, I have a mental checklist that I'm starting to go through. And that checklist has all to do with my, my safety. And, and, and so when I'm going to the store, I want to know ahead of time, are people wearing masks? Mm. Are people practicing social distancing? Do I have to touch the door to walk into wherever I'm walking into? When I go to pay, gosh, you know, do I have to take my card and put it into that reader? Um, do I have to take my phone and tap something? Uh, because everything that I touch, possibly something I'm going to have to clean up and I'm going to have to be concerned about. Um, when they give me whatever I buy, are they going to touch it? You know, it's it's yeah. uh, it's an odd set of ch uh, checks and balances that are running through that have never really crossed any of our minds in the past. How long am I going to have to wait in line before I can even walk into the store? When I wait in line, are they are they good about keeping us all separate? Because I, I get really creeped out when somebody gets too close to, mm -hmm. to me, you know. Mm -hmm. So how, how good is it being monitored? You know, I know that this phenomenon of touchless retail is is you know it, right now it's a pretty big buzz you know touchless um i typically when i think touchless i think are they going to deliver it to my home uh you know and and how's that how's that going to work can i just order it online or on my phone and they're going to deliver it and I, so i don't have to deal with anybody and that that certainly is part of touchless but i think it's like touchless because of safety mm -hmm. because of my own feeling of of personal uh uh safety and so I do believe that kind of information uh, is going to have an impact in the world of, of, of commerce. And, and so, you know, if, if it's only for the next six months, totally understand. Um, so maybe there's a short shelf life on that. If you work from the hypothesis that this may play out over some time, uh, uh, it may be a couple of years before, you know, we feel comfortable, you know, all pressed against each other in line for Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, it's, yeah, you know, it's it's going to be a while before we get there, I think. And that's that's the um, if that's the case, then those are the kinds of, of questions that people want to have answers to. Yeah, those are those are actually really good, thoughtful questions. Because I I noticed that um, when I go to certain stores, I was just at um, Target a couple of weeks ago, and they were doing a really good job of like they had markers and where people should stand, and then before you can even approach the register. They would wipe down that, mm. that bear belt like for like two or three minutes they'd be wiping down every aspect of it and then wiping down the the credit card machine and your confidence that. level shoots up my yeah you know, i was like they are, and they're all wearing gloves and mat and i was like this is amazing and i don't have that experience at very many stores but now to me target i'm like when i think about where i need to go someplace i'm thinking oh i know target's going to be on top of everything even if there is a line this whole pivot this whole pivot that's taking place, there are going to be win winners and losers. I mean, that's that is, that is clear. Um, even even for restaurants that do takeout, those that are pivoting to online ordering versus over the telephone, those are uh, pivoting to cubbies and kiosks or whatever that you pick your food up and take off versus having somebody behind a register go and bring you your food and hand it to you. It's the, all these things are going to make an impact. So it's. Uh, you know, it's a lot of new information. Um, I'm sure that that uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to be identifying even other areas that we're going to want to drill into. But it all has to do back to you know who's who's going to be okay when this is over, and who's not going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And and so that's that's what we're trying to get our hands around the best we can. Yeah, uh, I was chatting with somebody, and they're talking about like the future of homes and remodeling, and they're talking about how like because of this pandemic and potentially future pandemics, like homes with bigger pantries, homes with, you know, office spaces and USB ports all over the place because they're expecting people to be working from home more. I believe that. I, uh, what's interesting is I, I thought we were kind of on the downside slope of the curve about the size of a home. I haven't studied, studied it, uh, but just uh, anecdotally, you know, by observation, it seems that you know, maybe 10 years ago, we'd almost peaked in terms of people wanting like exceptionally large homes to live in. And they've been starting to get more efficient and, and 
you know, better use of space and the square footage has gotten smaller. And, and it seemed like we were moving back in that, that direction. I'm wondering if um, because of this work from home uh, phenomenon, that folks will probably be more likely to spend more time at home over the future, if that, that curve may, may take a bit of a pivot itself. So not that it has much to do with the work that I do in the lab. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I, I always enjoy thinking about the future. I mean, it is, it is yeah. fun. And, you know, yeah. even as a kid, I, I, you know, I remember I was in high school and uh, uh, there was a book called Megatrends that came out. Uh, which was, you know, kind of one of those uh, future, if you, what's going to happen in the future, which, by the way, they talked about working at home in that book and from the oh. 1980s. So, yeah, it was, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember the name of the person who wrote that, but, it, it, you know, prescient, you know, probably, you really saw the future. Um, but ever since I read that book, I've been fascinated with, you know, these trends that shape shape us and, and how we might, might, might evolve. I mean, one of the things that uh, we had been spending a lot of time in the lab on up until maybe six months ago was around augmented and virtual reality. And mm -hmm. the reason why is because if you followed, you know, venture capitalist money, there's a lot of money pouring in uh, into that space. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, in, if you're going to be buying a car in virtual reality or uh, shopping for a home with your, you know, uh, Google glasses on or whatever, snap glass, whatever it's going to be. Uh, and you're looking at a home and you're thinking about, could I qualify for a mortgage? We wanted to make sure Experian is inserted in that process. We're the piece of, piece of technology that gets wrapped in as a, a callable API that pops up, and we're right in it. So we spent quite a bit of time on augmented reality, a little bit of time on virtual. And this pandemic, I bring this up because this pandemic, one of the things that you would say would likely if people were going to spend more time in their homes over the long haul, because behaviors are going to change as a result of this, then, then you're going to see a, a stronger win to the sales of augmented and virtual. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of excited in a way that some of that work, we're going to be able to dust off a little bit and, and you know, refresh and, and bring to market. But I do think that we'll probably see more money uh, being invested in that, in that area um, and, um, and hopefully some great products that will come, come to us as a result. You know, I think the, uh, augmented reality, I think, is a little – clunky uh if you if you if you look at you know microsoft hololens or the magic leap product or uh what was snap you know the, the snap got uh, what are they called snap specs oh yeah 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 you know yeah okay not not terribly exciting i have to believe that those engines are running pretty hard right now because they've got a market that is hungry for it more hungry now than it was before yeah i even noticed that pokemon go just pivoted because that always relied on you being outside. Yeah, now they're doing something you can be at home to play. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because I hadn't heard anything about Pokemon Go uh, in probably two years. You know, it was like that that big flash phenomenon, yeah, yeah, yeah. just popping up again. Like like yeah. people are playing it, and uh, you know, they don't have to leave their house. They can find they can find Pokemon in their backyard. <laughs> That's right. That's, <laughs> not That's my right. thing, but I get it. You know. That's right. AR and VR started getting a lot of publicity a couple of years ago. And when Pokemon Go came out using, you know, the Pokemon and augmented reality was like a fun thing. Uh, my wife actually still plays and my sister-in-law still plays all the time. Hmm. And, uh, but now that we're all at home, she has been playing. So now they're pivoting. Uh, but it was interesting. My, my daughter, she just turned 14. And I asked her, like, write down a list of things that she wanted for her birthday. And she put down VR. She wanted a VR headset. So it's interesting that that's like becoming top of mind. Oh, again. I think that's going to become huge. Yeah, it's just... Uh... I'm I'm not as bored as I thought I would be, and uh, just sitting in in home, you know, because there's always there's just so much to I find so much to do around here. But I uh, uh, I, I do know a lot of people that are starting to climb the walls, <laughs> and, and so you know, uh, virtual reality I think is going to you know that's that's going to be quite an escape for for many. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, I think you know it would be awesome if we could introduce virtual reality to like what we're doing right now, like if we were sitting in a room together. Um, and, and maybe, maybe for now we, we were talking, you know, avatar to avatar versus, you know, a, a, a good approximation of, of, you know, your individual image, but I'm up for it. You know, like yeah. I would pay for that. I would love it. You know, it's, uh, you know, change the game and make it more, more interactive and, and more close to reality. Yeah. I think, I think what I like about that idea too is, is all the nonverbal cues you get when you're in person, 
And if that could be translated to a VR experience where totally. you can actually see me, my body movements more easily, and like, and with AR, like being able to like maybe even get those emotional cues, like, hey, Mike's happy, like that's making him happy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Versus, uh, you know, trying to figure it out a tone over over the phone too, and it's like so mm -hmm. challenging. Any pause, and then you're like. <laughs> are they pausing because they're thinking? Are they pausing because I said something that upset them? They're, why? Why? Why do we have this right. awkward two-second pause? You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Any sort of silence is like, oh no, my connection's wrong, or they can't hear me. Uh, but let's talk about the uh, the future of education. I I just heard that you were appointed to Columbia's board of overseers, and I would love for you to talk a little bit about that and your role in helping the future of education. You know, I I'm just thrilled about it i uh, when i uh i, I was a, a we'll call it a, a one of the probably the oldest people to graduate from columbia so i i went back to school and got a master's degree and um it was a fantastic experience uh, and when i graduated i let the university know hey you know I, I really just don't want this to stop here i i uh um i i wanted to learn is you know i felt like if there's anything i'm leaving on the table that you know could help me do what I do better, I wanted to learn. And uh, secondly, being associated with Columbia, I mean, the, the people that are a part of that university and the programs are some of the finest in the world. And I wanted to get to know them. And I wanted to see if I could collaborate with them. So when I graduated, I said, hey, if there's anything I can do to help the university, I'm, I'm in. Uh, and they uh, said, hey, would you like to be on our board of overseers? Which, uh, you know, shocked, shocked me. I, I was, I was I'm really blown away by it. So um, the, uh, the agenda for Columbia, why they asked me to be a part of it is uh, they actually have a very strong vision around analytics and AI. And they believe that um, it's not just the programs that they have around advanced analytics and artificial intelligence that uh, will focus on, on that. That, that, that those, those things are going to be cut across so many of their programs. It's becoming a part of everything that we're doing and so what they're hoping was you know in my involvement and experience representing Experian on their board is that we could give them that insight you know when we're talking about uh health care or uh, uh you know you know the future of, uh, of education and medicine and you know any one of a number of different areas that uh we will introduce that perspective of how analytics can play a role how they can make adjustments in their curriculum and the programs that they offer, the investments that they're going to want to make, the strategic partnerships that the university is going to take. So, so that's my my function on the board, is is to focus on that. That's like my area of expertise that I bring in. The board has like the CEO of Celebrity Cruises and the head of that's Forbes so cool. and the head of National Geographic. I mean, they, it's it's an incredible group awesome. of individuals, uh, but they all bring different pieces. <laughs> To it, and so our job is to support uh, uh, Dean Jason Wingard, who is uh, the dean of the school, and, and give him as much insight as we can to help him as he makes those big decisions. That's super cool that they're kind of integrating data analytics into like all of the different programming. Yeah. What what um, what kind of excites you about some of the potential and how data science is being brought into uh, even maybe even humanities courses? Yeah, I am. Um, Oh gosh, humanity. So, so it's funny that I just got off a meeting before this it was all around uh, fairness and uh, uh, um, in artificial intelligence. And uh, fairness is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, when you talk about humanities, if you, you know, that's there, it, it is, I'd say we're at the very beginning stages of that, that debate in defining things and, uh, you know, converting or representing uh, uh, philosophies of, uh, of a culture. Uh, and representing that uh, in analytics, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that need to be worked through. Um, I'm really excited. I I'll tell you this: I started my career as a guy reading reports and manually taking data from reports and putting statistics against it to try to figure out, you know, what was happening. And um, I got excited about that. I liked finding things that nobody else could find. You know, I felt like it was treasure treasure hunting. And when I found a treasure that could save the company money or make the company money, I, I, I'm super excited. That, you know, that was 
Oh, well, I won't say how many years ago. It was a long time ago. And the world has changed so dramatically. And it seems to happen so quickly from year to year that the, the, it's like the rate of change is accelerating. So when I think about data science and analytics, you know, I'm excited that the university has chosen, chosen me to be on the board. I, I do see it as a representat representation of Experian because they really want somebody like Experian and our breadth of, of knowledge around data and artificial intelligence is that's, they're really tapping that, right? Because that's what I tap in terms of uh, develop my knowledge base. But the thing is, what I, what I think about today, I know, I know for a fact is gonna be different. Like, well, I'll just say generically tomorrow because everything's changing so much. So I do get excited about it. I think, um, you know, what bothered me about education five years ago doesn't bother me today. Mm. You know, I used to, I used to feel that um, we weren't doing enough to prepare individuals with the right tools to be able to do the kind of work that we needed them to do uh, in, in machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence. Uh, I think that's different now. I think, um, you know, the, it will be interesting to see how we pivot. But I think one thing that probably will be more of an emphasis in education going forward, and this is my, my opinion, I can't say it represents Columbia, but I, is that the, the emphasis on continuous learning mm. is going to be stronger. Because things are changing so much, you know, we used to go to school, we would learn something, we would learn a field, and then we go and we become practitioners. You learn as you practice, and that is fundamentally, uh, you know, how we evolve in our work. Unfortunately, if you are confined in your practice and you don't have the exposure to what's coming up and what's new, your learning can become stagnant. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, you know, one of the roles of the university over time, my opinion, would be to help teach people how to teach themselves in a better way. I mean, we're told that, you know, you learn how to research and things, but then you go become a practitioner and a lot of the times those, those skills atrophy. Um, but being able to think as a practitioner in constantly learning will help us grow. And I think that's the only way the best companies are going to be able to not only keep up, but lead is through this mindset uh, and in and, and, and practice. This idea of continuing to learn your high school diploma, your college degree, like that's just like the start. Like, that's right. Because my thought originally when I finished college was like, I'm done. I'm done yeah. with all this. Everybody thinks that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, give me, celebrate my success. I finished, you know, that's, uh, I don't have to do this ever again. Yeah. <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> but learning does, you know, after you have, you know, degrees, Degrees are often painful because I think um, they often push us out of our comfort zone. Like you don't usually, even in graduate school, you get to choose a field to specialize in, but you often have to take classes that you wouldn't normally take. And, and sometimes the greatest learning happens when you're pushed out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. but, but that's usually what you associate with, you know, I, I made it through because it is painful, especially if you are pushed. Um, uh, but, you know, in life, uh, you know, usually you don't intentionally push yourself like that. You kind of gravitate to what you like, what, you know, some people gravitate to what's easy. You know, that's not, that's not abnormal. Um, uh, so, so it is, it is hard to push yourself into a mindset of saying, okay, these things are changing. I have to learn it. I need to, in fact, I don't want to just learn it. I want to master it. I want to be able to teach others. I want to be able to lead. And that's, um, you know, those are good. Those are good traits, and I think that's going to be more far high, far more in demand as we progress. It's so true. Like I remember, the classes I remember most are the ones that were the hardest, the most difficult, the ones that pushed me the most. I, I was a humanities for for an undergrad, mm -hmm. and um, I took a visual basic C plus plus class under the computer science. I don't know what I was thinking. My friend was like, "Yeah, you should take that." And I was like, "Oh, okay, I'll take it," and as my elective. And uh, I still remember. Wow, I still I'm impressed. Remember, and I remember, I just remember like after that class, my respect for computer scientists and data scientists just like shot up the roof because I had never, I had no idea what it was until I took a class where it exposed me how to do it. We had our hand write code in that class. It was extremely difficult for me because that wasn't my, my strength at all. And uh, but I just grew, I grew tremendously from that the exposure. 
and my respect level for <laughs> data scientists just went. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah well, it, it, what's funny is I, you know, I started. So my my favorite classes in high school were in, were my literature classes, and so when I went to um, college, I actually my undergrad, I initially majored in journalism, and you know I, I loved I loved writing, I loved uh, reading. You know, it's like my th math was I was good at math, but that wasn't what I was interested in. I was interested in you know other things, um, and. Uh, <laughs> What I realized is I wasn't very good at it. You know, it's like, you, you, uh, you know, math was always the easy A and, you know, lit challenged me like crazy. And I struggled, you know, to get whatever grade I got, uh, but I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I went to uh, journalism school, I realized that, you know, uh, hey, you know, the expectations are, are up here. I need to perform at that level. And that was so hard for me. And so that what wound up happening is even though I went down the data science path, um, I, uh, my respect for journalists is mm. off the charts mm. because I, I, you know, I, I had a taste for a couple of years of what it's like to be in journalism school and, and realize it's really hard. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's very challenging, exceptionally challenging. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's kind of goes the other way. Zing and a zang. <laughs> uh, before I go, Eric, one of our top questions we have in our data science communities is around getting the first job. And right now, um, people can't even come into interview in person. And so I was wondering maybe you can just share some advice for these young graduates who are just getting out of college, looking for their first job, looking for a data science role. And right now it's gonna be very, very difficult because um, they can't just walk in and interview. And I was wondering maybe you can just share some tips for them. So, you know, it's pretty rare that we'll hire somebody just out of like undergrad in our labs because uh, the labs tend to hire people with experience. If we do hire out of school, it will be somebody out of grad school and uh, often people that are just completed their doctorates. Um, but if you're an undergrad, I actually have my daughter is graduating uh, from USC uh, this spring. Oh, that's uh, awesome. In uh, um, computational and applied math. Wow. And, uh, yeah, she's uh, really sharp uh, when it comes to math. Uh, and um, she likes to code. So she's actually, she wants to be a data scientist. That's, that's actually what, what she wants. Um, while she was going through school, I, I encouraged her to get internships that would allow her to learn a bit about the field. And so if you're just graduating college, if you, you should have at least one internship under your belt or one job uh, that you can point to that's relevant in the field. If you don't, this is going to be a tough time period, I think, this summer to find work. I think, um, you know, just being honest, I, I think it's going to be a challenge. Um, so take the opportunity to, uh, even if you have to, hey, not everybody can do this, but if you can bunk with your parents and work for free in an internship for someone, do it. You know, get get that experience. Uh, you got to know Python. Everybody's going to ask you if you know Python. So know Python. Uh, and um, as far as, as the actual practicing of data science, uh, show that you've moved some data around, that, that you know you understand uh, what it means to uh, uh, look at data and, and look for, for uh, where it might be uh, uh, dirty, meaning like uh, fields are empty or there's data in fields that shouldn't be there, and, and understand what it means to clean the data and to fix it and get it right. Uh, nobody's going to expect you, a person graduating, to be a, a modeler. Nobody's going to expect you to know how to build a, a model of, in any industry. If you, if, if you worked on something like that when you interned, fantastic. But nobody's going to expect that. But they are going to expect you to, to know how to code um, and probably worked on some kind of assignment uh, uh, for a company in an internship where you had to work with data. Um, if you haven't been able to check those boxes, Python, work with data, Take the opportunity and do it over the summer. Uh, you'll make yourself way more marketable. Uh, uh, it's it's otherwise it's it's hard. Now some some kids say you know students young people graduate from a, a really good university. Any of the UC schools here in California, lots of great students coming out of the UC schools in, in California, um, and they may have a degree in computer science, um, and they may not have the experience. They may have a little bit more luck because of the prestige of the program 
that they're graduating from. And with some of the larger companies, they may have a, um, a training program that will take a recent computer science graduate and get them to a point where they can contribute. Um, but that is, you know, if you're fortunate enough to get that, that's great, but that's the top, the top level that can get away with maybe not having that experience, but having the right kind of degree and uh, with good grades and getting into a, you know, one of those kinds of programs. But uh, you know, the vast majority don't get that opportunity. So you want to get real practical experience that you can demonstrate. There's a lot of demand out there. The timing is just because of the pandemic, the timing is bad, but um, it will get better. The market's going to turn around and the demand is, is never been stronger. So it's not like uh, the jobs aren't, aren't going to exist. They're going to, they're definitely going to exist. Uh, so there'll be plenty of opportunity for everyone. Eric, what do you look for when bringing on an intern? So, uh, like I said, the lab does operate at a pretty high standard. So, um, we, we, even for interns, we, we drill them like we drill people who are applying for jobs. So we put them through the same tests. Uh, we give them a written test. We interview them uh, and, uh, and they get paid. Our interns, our interns get paid um, uh, pretty well, actually. So they, so our expectation is pretty high. We're looking for uh, serious uh, uh, intellectual capacity. So we'll give them some really challenging uh, problems that I'll say uh, uh, will reflect their ability to problem solve. Uh, their mathematical mathematics acumen uh, will give them coding challenges, just how to sort, index, you know, maybe move data around. Um, it's, we read their code, so we give everyone you can code in whatever you like. You can even write pseudocode if you want, but we're going to review it and assess how well you code. Uh, and then, uh, and then we, for for some, uh, not necessarily for interns. I don't think we've done this for interns for a while. But we've actually created a synthetic uh, corpus of data mm. that we pass to somebody and give them 72 hours to uh, clean. They have to figure out all the problems with it. And then they, uh, they model uh, based on some things they feel they can predict off the data. And then we have them take us through their cleaning process and their modeling process. And, you know, that's, that's a, a pretty clear picture of what you're getting in the door. So... Uh, if you don't feel confident that you can pass that kind of test, so there, there, there are basically two types of people, right? Somebody who hears what I just said and they get pretty pumped. <laughs> you know, I want to try, you know, yeah. I don't know. If, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not, but I gotta, I gotta do it. I want to, I want to strut my stuff. You know, I want to show what I'm capable of and hopefully what I've got is going to make you make the cut. And there are going to be other people that hear that and go, Ooh, you know, that's, Oh, uh, forget that. I don't want to do with that. So, you know, you know who you are when you're listening to this, right? And that, that's, uh, uh, it's, it, it, by, w once you start putting people through rigor of that, there's almost a self-selection process. If you make it through the process, there's a good chance uh, you want to be there and we want you. Uh, if you, if you, if you wilt like a wallflower, you know, that's, uh, that, that says a lot right there too. What are, what are some of the, the soft skills you're looking for? Humility. Humility is number one. Uh, you know, most of the people that we hire have done very well academically. Uh, they're used to being top of their class or, you know, they're valedictorian or salutatorian often, not always, but often. Uh, it's not a requirement to go to a top university, but almost all of them went to top universities. It's just the people who wind up making it through the process. And, and so when you're wrestling with a problem uh, where you might have six scientists in a room, and they all have different opinions. You know, they don't always agree. In fact, more often than not, there's a pretty good debate. And, and so if they don't have, if humility is not uh, a natural characteristic for them, uh, it would create a lot of tension, mm. right? If, if you have a lot of folks that are so convinced that they're right, that, you know, they're going to, you know, be confrontational or aggressive or condescending or, you know, there's, there's lots of these uh, behaviors that you can have if you're not hum humble, uh, especially in a debate that are all are destructive. They're not constructive. So um, we interview for that. We want people that check, check their, 
their ego at the door. Um, and we're more in pursuit of truth. Mm. You know, it's, uh, um, if we have a debate and there are two or three paths that, you know, collectively we can't determine which is the right one, we may, we may pursue all three for a very short period of time and then regroup and say, okay, you know, first fruits, what, uh, what do we see? Uh, what looks like it's going to bear the most, uh, you know, chance for success. And then we scale back to and go, you know, make our bet on one. So, um, it's got to be a group that's willing to, to work that way or some, an individual that's willing to work that way in a group. And so that's, that's probably the biggest one. The second one, uh, which is important is communication. Um, so, uh, you know, when you get, you know, we're, we're generally, I mean this in the nicest way, a bunch of geeks. And, <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, we'll tend to work through things uh, uh, the way that we like to think about it. You know, which every every single person in the lab, I say, has their own. Sorry about that. Has their own superpower, and um, and uh, because of that that superpower, they look at things differently, um, and their ability to express or articulate what's in their mind to everyone else is important. If they, you know, almost shell up or seal up in their own little world that they only they understand it's not helpful you know mm -hmm. we can't progress uh the thinking around that so uh we do interview for that too so humility and communication are probably the two soft skills that um uh, you have to check the boxes on well eric i want to thank you so much for being on data talk uh, for sharing your insights with us for those that want to keep up with your work follow you what is the best way for them to do that uh, well, I do post things on LinkedIn. You know, it's like uh, if the lab is uh, got a new product out or wrestling with something new that I think would be interesting to folks, I'll post it on LinkedIn. Well, thank you so much, Eric, for being on the show. Oh, thanks for inviting us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Data Talk. We share out new episodes every single week, and you can find the full catalog of previous episodes as well as YouTube videos by going to the Experian News Blog. The URL is just experian.com slash data talk. And as always, we love hearing from our community. So if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows, please reach out. You can find us on Twitter at Experian Data Lab, or you can always reach out to me directly. My email is michael.delgado at experian.com. Take care and we'll chat next week.